On February 23, 1996, the people of the state of California finally followed through on their decision that the world would be a better place without William Bonin. After fighting for his life for 17 years, the notorious freeway killer became the first person to be executed by lethal injection in California. For the survivors of the 14 young men and boys who Bonin was convicted of killing, and of the nearly 30 others whom this classic sociopath is suspected of slaying, the freeway killer's execution probably lacked an element of justice. Sure, Bonin, called the poster boy for capital punishment by Governor Pete Wilson, paid for his crimes with his life, but his method of death was infinitely more pleasant than that of his victims. Anyone who has had surgery using a local anesthetic or undergone a colonoscopy or an abortion can relate to how Bonin felt in the few moments before his execution. If he had any knowledge of what was about to happen, he didn't show it. With the strong dose of tranquilizer in his system, he certainly didn't care. Stoned on state-sanctioned Valium, Bonin was strapped to a hospital gurney in the refurbished California gas chamber and pumped full of three different chemicals. The first, sodium pentothal, a.k.a. truth serum, rendered him unconscious in about a second. The next dose, pancuronium bromide, paralyzed his muscles and made it impossible for him to breathe, much like the curare in a South American Indian blowgun. The final dose, potassium chloride, came a few seconds later and instantly stopped his heart. Three minutes after the first injection, Bonin was declared dead. His body was removed by prison officials, and when none of his relatives claimed it, they didn't bother coming to the execution in San Quentin. He was cremated and spread in the Pacific Ocean. In the end, the remains of one of California's most notorious murderers was treated with a great deal more respect than he had for his victims. Most of them were dumped, naked and ravaged, along the labyrinthine Southern California highway system, giving ride to Bonin's nom de mort. Outside the walls of San Quentin, William Bonin had nearly as many supporters as he had enemies. Capital punishment has become such a divisive issue in America that executions became excuses for pro- and anti-capital punishment rallies. Activists and celebrities like Mike Farrell, formerly B.J. Honeycutt and M.A.S.H., and friends and relatives of the victims, and just the plain curious, squared off in the cold rain outside the prison until the word was sent that Bonin was dead. Bonin's last words, delivered to the warden about an hour before his execution, expressed no remorse for his crimes and merely pointed out that he thought the death penalty was unfair. Bonin added some words of advice for potential serial killers. I would suggest that when a person has a thought of doing anything serious against the law, that before they did that, they should go to a quiet place and think about it seriously. Bonin, who spent more time on death row than a majority of his victims spent on earth, was 49. Seven years old, William Bonin was already on his way to being a lost cause. The child of an abusive, alcoholic father who once gambled away the family home, Bonin and his brother were often left by their mother in the care of her father. Alice Benton left them with their grandfather even though she had grown up being violated by the man, a well-known pedophile. Bonin's mother spent all of her free time playing bingo, often forgetting to feed her children, and neighbors said the Bonin boys were always hungry, dirty, and ill-clothed. During his eighth year, Bonin served his first stint behind bars, being jailed in juvenile hall for stealing license plates. In that hellhole of a reformery, Bonin became the sexual plaything to older boys, setting the stage for his twisted understanding of sex. The detention home was a veritable house of horrors where sexual sadism, inquisition-like punishments such as submersion in ice water and threats at the point of knife were commonplace. While in detention, According to Connecticut medical records, Bonin had been approached for sex by an older boy and although young William was afraid of the attacker, agreed to participate, provided that he be restrained. An older boy approached Bonin for homosexual contact and Bonin was frightened. But Bonin agreed to do it if the older boy would tie his hands behind his back, allowing Mr. Bonin to feel more secure and less frightened, the records showed. To a Georgetown University hospital neurologist who examined Bonin during his incarceration for the freeway killings, the incident suggests much more about Bonin's earlier years. The fact that Bonin, at age eight, was sexually aware and asked for restraints led the neurologist to believe he had been a prior victim of violent assault. It is inconceivable that he was not sexually abused and forcibly restrained by adult abusers before the incident, Dr. Pincus, the neurologist, wrote in a report to Bonin's lawyers. William eventually returned to his home, where he began fondling his brother and other children in the area. 
William joined the U.S. Air Force and logged 700 hours in combat or patrol while serving as an aerial gunner in Vietnam, where his service record indicates he was a good soldier, winning a good conduct medal. It wasn't until after he received his honorable discharge that the military learned Bonin had violated two men in his outfit at gunpoint. He moved from his native Connecticut to Southern California, where he began the dark descent into savagery that would end in San Quentin 21 years later. It didn't take long for Bonin to succumb to his demons. His first known interaction with the law came in 1969, when he was accused of violating five boys in Los Angeles County. In each case, Bonin picked up the boys while driving around, then handcuffed and sodomized them. Convicted of the assaults, Bonin was deemed a mentally disordered sex offender and rather than being sent to prison, was remanded to the Atascadero State Hospital. He was examined by several neurologists, psychiatrists, and psychologists, but what treatment he received for his damaged psyche is unknown. Bonin had no memory of being physically abused. Doctors suspect he repressed the memory. There is much data to indicate that Bonin was severely and recurrently violated as a child, wrote one psychiatrist who examined William. Doctors found a variety of other physical and psychological anomalies, brain damage in the area that is thought to restrain violent impulses, manic depressive illness, and several unexplained scars on his head and backside. Bonin, the doctors said, could not explain the scars. Five years later, Bonin was released from the state hospital and placed on probation for five years. Clearly, by this point, William was unable to control his sick urges. He was a practicing pedophile, but hadn't yet become a killer. On the last day of summer vacation in 1975, David McVicker was thumbing for a ride to Huntington Beach. He was 14. Bonin offered McVicker a ride. He was totally cool. There was nothing in the least bit strange about him, McVicker told the Los Angeles Times shortly before Bonin's execution. Bonin asked the young man for sex, and McVicker asked him to stop the car. William pulled out a gun, drove to a remote area, and violated the boy. Bonin began to choke McVicker with his t-shirt the same method Bonin would later use to kill several of his victims. McVicker, gagging, thought he was going to die. When McVicker cried out, Bonin released him, and to McVicker's astonishment, he apologized for choking me. The attack on McVicker was especially notable for a couple of events. First, McVicker was the last successful attack for Bonin in which he did not kill, and it was the last time he would ever be known to admit regret for his actions. Like other victims of violating assault, McVicker's suffering didn't end when Bonin freed him. To this day, he told the Times, he suffers for Bonin's crime. Feeling dirty and ashamed, he told only his best friend what happened. His mother never wanted to hear the details, McVicker said. School no longer mattered, and he quit school that same year. He attended continuation high schools, but never received a diploma. As Bonin's execution neared, McVicker said nightmares replaying the assaults plagued him. Sometimes I wake myself up yelling, McVicker said. Imagine going to sleep and getting violated 10 to 20 times a night. McVicker did go to the police and, based on his testimony, Bonin was convicted of lewd and lascivious conduct and sent back to prison. He served about three years behind bars. Despite having been convicted of kidnapping and two counts of sodomy with a child in 1968, being diagnosed as a sexual predator, and demonstrating criminal sexual conduct seven years later, Bonin was released by the California prison system in 1978. Less than a year after being released from prison for the McVicker attack, Bonin found himself behind bars once again. He was picked up by Orange County officers while he assaulted a 17-year-old hitchhiker. Incredibly, a records mix-up allowed Bonin to walk out of jail before his trial. Not surprisingly, he never showed for his day in court. That simple clerical error would eventually result in the deaths of more than three dozen young men. Freed by a stroke of fate, Bonin had no intention of ever leaving witnesses to his crimes. A friend who would eventually collect a $20,000 reward for a tip that led to Bonin's capture remembers talking with William shortly before he disappeared into the seamy underworld of Los Angeles. I can remember he said, No one's going to testify again. This is never going to happen to me again his friend recalled in an interview 10 years after Bonin's arrest. Shortly after Bonin's release, the slayings by the fiend the media dubbed the Freeway Killer began. At the end of 1979, Southern California was in a state of near panic. Parents were afraid to let their children out of the house, and it appeared that the police were powerless to stop a vicious killer who liked to violate, strangle, and stab. The Freeway Killer could practice his grisly trade at will.
The first to die was an exchange student from Germany named Marcus Grabs. The 17-year-old was on a backpacking tour of the United States. Marcus was last seen hitchhiking on the scenic Pacific Coast Highway in Newport Beach on August 5, 1979. His last mistake in this world was accepting a lift from William Bonin. Sometime between 6 p.m. and 10 p.m., according to police, Bonin and a friend, Vernon Butts, picked up Marcus, sodomized and beat the German, and left his nude body in Malibu Canyon. Grabs had been stabbed more than 70 times and was found with a yellow nylon rope around his neck. An electrical cord was wrapped around one ankle. William later told a friend that he had killed Marcus Grabs out of self-defense, although this explanation is unlikely to be true. Vernon Butts was a low-life drifter with a long criminal record of petty offenses who was what prosecutors referred to as doing life in prison on the installment plan. He had been in and out of penile institutions and was excited by sadistic homosexual activities, undoubtedly something he had picked up during one of his stays behind bars. Butts accompanied Bonin on several of his killing forays and was as depraved and twisted as William. Together, they would prowl the highways of Southern California in Bonin's olive drab van, looking for teens to ravage. Butts would eventually be arrested for his role in the freeway killings and save the taxpayers of California a great deal of time and expense by hanging himself in his Los Angeles County jail cell. Three weeks after Grabs' nude body was found in Malibu Canyon, 15-year-old Donald Hyden of Hollywood turned up dead and mutilated in a trash bin near the Ventura Freeway. He had last been seen near the Gay Community Services Center in L.A. Bonin and Butts had struck again. Hayden was violated and strangled with a ligature. His throat had also been slashed and an attempt had been made to castrate him. On September 12, 1979, the body of David Murillo, 17, was found near the Ventura Freeway. He had disappeared while riding his bike to the movies three days earlier. His head had been bashed in with a tire iron. He had been sodomized and strangled with a ligature. For some time, Orange and Los Angeles County officials denied that they had a serial killer on their hands. Although the modus operandi of the three killings were similar, it wasn't until several more slayings occurred that authorities acknowledged what the media had been reporting for weeks. But the facts were there. Somewhere in Southern California, a serial killer was loose, leaving few clues, and seemed free to murder whenever the mood struck. Bonin either laid low for several months or changed his method of operation significantly enough to avoid being suspected of any killings until December 1979, when the body of Frank Fox, 17, was found in a similar condition to the previous victims, near Ortega Highway and the I-5 freeway. Psychiatrists at his Los Angeles trial said Bonin was likely in a manic state when he killed. His violent sexual urges would finally be irresistible. He described feeling excited by the prospect of killing someone, of being barely able to wait for sundown so he could begin to cruise to pick up someone for this purpose and obtain some sense of release wrote one psychiatrist to examine Bonin. Earl Hansen, a Los Angeles attorney who represented Bonin when he confessed to the murders, compared Bonin's thirst for violence to a dope habit. He had to constantly increase the dosage to get the same euphoria. On the morning of February 3, 1980, Bonin and another sexual psychopath, Gregory Matthew Miley, were cruising the highways when they saw 15-year-old Charles Miranda in West Hollywood. Picking up the young man, they drove for several blocks and parked the van. Bonin then sodomized Miranda and urged Miley to do the same, but Miley was unable to sustain an erection, according to official reports. Frustrated with his impotence, Miley violated the teen with a blunt object. Then, Bonin took over again. Sterling E. Norris, the prosecutor who convicted Bonin of ten murders, said Bonin often goaded and belittled his accomplices into helping with the killing. Can you do it? Bonin asked Miley as he choked 15-year-old Charles Miranda. Let me show you how to do this. Bonin strangled Miranda with a boy's shirt, using a tire iron to twist the shirt like a tourniquet around Miranda's neck. Miranda's nude body was found in a Los Angeles alley. Bonin loved the killing, said Norris. He delighted in talking about it. Driven with bloodlust, Bonin and Miley drove around some more after dumping Miranda's corpse. They wanted to kill again. Their next victim was 12-year-old James McCabe, who was waiting at a bus stop for a bus to Disneyland. While Miley drove around, Bonin assaulted the youngster and strangled him, again using the boy's shirt and a tire iron. James McCabe, who was looking for a trip to the Magic Kingdom and met lurking death instead, was found three days later near a dumpster in Walnut City. 
Bonin and Miley used the $6 they found in his wallet to buy lunch. Other murders followed quickly. Ronald Gatlin, 18, of Van Nuys, disappeared from North Hollywood on March 14, 1980, violated and strangled. His body was discovered the next day in Duarte. Harry Todd Turner, 14, Los Angeles, disappeared from Hollywood on March 20, 1980, violated and strangled. His body was found five days later near the Santa Monica Freeway. Glenn Norman Barker, 14, Huntington Beach, violated and strangled. His body was found on March 22, 1980, beside Ortega Highway. Russell Dwayne Rue, 15, Garden Grove, disappeared while waiting for a bus to take him to his fast food job, violated and strangled. His body was found on March 22, 1980, beside Ortega Highway, alongside the body of Glenn Barker. Stephen Wood, 16, Bellflower, last seen April 10, 1980, on his way to school, violated and strangled. His body was found the next day. Lawrence Eugene Sharp, 18, Long Beach, last seen April 10, 1980, violated and strangled. His body was found May 18, 1980, in a trash bin behind a Westminster service station. Darren Lee Kendrick, 19, Cyprus, disappeared on April 29, 1980, from a Stanton store where he worked. In addition to being sodomized and strangled by ligature, Darren apparently was forced to ingest chloral hydrate which left him with caustic chemical burns on his mouth, chin, chest, and stomach. Darren also had an ice pick through his right ear that caused a fatal wound to the upper cervical spinal cord. His body was found the next morning. Bonin had the police running in circles and was enjoying the publicity his killings were receiving. He would point out to his friends the work that the freeway killer was doing and once remarked that, this guy is giving good gays like us a bad name. He was keeping a scrapbook of his work in his van. A nondescript arrest would soon blow the case wide open, however. In May, police busted a car thief named William Pooh. The 17-year-old was more than just a thief, however. He had been along for the ride when Bonin killed Harry Turner and would eventually serve six years for voluntary manslaughter, part of a plea deal in exchange for his testimony. In an attempt to save his own skin, Pooh told authorities that he'd accepted a ride from a man who had boasted of the freeway killings. Police began looking for William Bonin based on Pooh's allegations. On the morning of June 2, 1980, Bonin and another accomplice, a mentally challenged drifter named James Monroe, picked up 19-year-old Stephen Wells. According to Monroe's testimony, Wells agreed to accompany the men back to the apartment they were sharing so that they could have sex. Monroe, who is serving a 15-to-life sentence in Mule Creek State Prison in Ione, California for his role in Wells's death, said that Bonin and Wells had sex and Bonin offered Wells $200 if he could tie up the young man. Wells agreed, Monroe said, and shortly after he was bound, Bonin began to assault him verbally and physically. Monroe said he watched TV in another room while Bonin tied up and violated the youth in his own mother's bedroom. Bonin called him in. He said, at that point, I knew it was real. Bonin went to get a glass of water and I told him, no, don't do this. But Bonin said, it's too late. There's nothing that you or I can do to stop it. Bonin said Monroe helped kill Wells, but Monroe claims he was in another room when the man was strangled. Regardless, his actions amounted to first-degree murder, which would have put him in the gas chamber right next to Bonin and Butts. After Wells was dead, Bonin and Monroe took the body in Bonin's van over to Butts' home, who told them to go dump it somewhere. The next day, Wells's body was found behind a gas station dumpster. Sadly, if the killers had tarried just a little longer at their apartment, they would have been observed by the LAPD detectives who had begun surveillance of William Bonin. There was a chance that they would have been able to save Wells' life. Over the next few days, detectives kept a close eye on William Bonin. For the next week, his activities were unremarkable. He would go to work as a truck driver each day and return home to his apartment late at night after visiting with friends around town. The night of Wells' murder, Bonin had hinted to Monroe that the drifter had better keep his mouth shut, or else. Monroe, fearful for his own life, fled back home to Michigan. Nine days after Wells' murder, Bonin's demons apparently returned, and he began looking for a new victim. Police officers tailing his van observed him trying to pick up five different young men, finally succeeding with a 15-year-old boy. They watched as Bonin drove to a deserted beach parking lot, and by the time they approached the van, they were able to arrest Bonin in the process of sodomizing the teenager. 
Tape and rope similar to that which bound his victims was found in the van, as well as William's scrapbook for freeway killer stories. Butts was picked up shortly after Bonin, and Monroe was arrested by Michigan State Police a month later. The freeway killer team was behind bars. This time, there would be no clerical errors. Bonin expressed no remorse for what he had done, although he did demonstrate embarrassment and regret at being apprehended. Once confronted with the evidence, he freely confessed to the police. After his arrest, Bonin told a reporter, I'd still be killing. I couldn't stop killing. It got easier each time. Bonin confessed to killing 21 young men and boys. He shared aspects of each crime in horrifying detail. Describing how he and Monroe murdered Wells, Bonin sounded like he was describing a weekend event to co-workers on Monday morning. Both me and Jim beat him up prior to killing him, Bonin can be heard saying in a soft monotone on police tapes. He said he wouldn't tell anyone, just to let him go. When we finally got around to killing him, we put a shirt around his neck. I twisted it, and he was strangled. Years later, Bonin's lack of feeling during his confession would still be remembered by those who were there. This guy was impassioned about what he did. He loved it, said Sterling E. Norris, the Los Angeles deputy district attorney who prosecuted Bonin. Listening to his confession was like sitting in a room of horrors. Here we are talking about killing kids, killing one and throwing them out like a piece of trash, and then going back to get another. It made me sick. Bonin's trial was short and sweet. It didn't take long for the prosecution to poke holes in his claim that Butts was the mind behind the madness. And it didn't take long for the jury to decide that William Bonin had to die for his crimes. But Bonin wasn't finished yet. He took advantage of the American legal system and appealed his sentence. Every time an appeal failed, he tried a different route. He tried to bargain with the knowledge he had of other unsolved murders, but his aid wasn't worth his life, authorities said. Finally, 17 years after the judge pronounced the sentence, the U.S. Supreme Court told the lawyer federal courts that no more stays would be issued unless they were issued by the Supreme Court. Bonin had a date with the executioner. In his 17-year fight, Bonin encountered one piece of good luck. After Robert Alton Harris died slowly and uncomfortably in the California gas chamber, a state court ruled that that method of execution was cruel and unusual. An alternate method would have to be found. California settled on lethal injection. In almost every instance, lethal injection was found to be a quick and relatively painless way to execute a convict. By the time Bonin had worn out his appeals, he had published a book of short stories, had an exhibition of his abstract paintings at a gallery in Seattle, and corresponded with many of the survivors of his victims. He once told the mother of one of his victims that her son had been his favorite victim because he was such a screamer. But still, Bonin would not give them the satisfaction of even one word of apology. He had even been able to win friends on the outside with his caring nature. He has a very basic sense of caring for human beings, said Alexis Skrilov, Bonin's biographer. I know that's completely the opposite of what everyone sees. On the day of the execution, Bonin was taken to a special holding cell on death row, issued new uniform pants and shirt, and given access to his spiritual advisor. For his last meal, he ate pepperoni and sausage pizza, Coca-Cola, and chocolate ice cream. He ate alone. At 11.01 p.m., prison guards called the telephone company to get the official time and to double-check that the phones in the death chamber were working. An hour later, technicians had been in the chamber, preparing the syringes and other medical supplies needed for the execution. Fifteen minutes before midnight, Bonin was taken from the holding cell and walked into the execution chamber. We have to take the word of the prison staff for how he acted during this time, because no witnesses were allowed to see William until he was strapped down on the gurney and the tranquilizer had been administered. The execution was scheduled to begin at 12.01 a.m., but was delayed for eight minutes while technicians struggled to find a good vein for the IV. Witnesses said it was impossible to tell if he was even alive at this point because he was laying with his eyes closed, breathing in a very shallow manner. By 12.13 a.m., William Bonin was dead. The final insult to the people of California didn't come until several weeks later when it was revealed that Bonin's family had been cashing his Social Security disability checks. Bonin's mother, Alice Benton, told the newspaper she used the money to make about $75,000 in payments on her Downey home. The benefit payments, which Bonin began receiving for mental disability in 1972, should have ended when he went to prison in 1982. But the money kept flowing, even though prison officials notified the Social Security Administration that Bonin was behind bars. 
The error came to light only after a funeral director notified Social Security of Bonin's death. Of the two men who assisted Bonin during his killing spree, only Miley and Monroe remain in prison. Miley is serving a 25-to-life term for first-degree murder, and Monroe has served more than the minimum of his 15-to-life sentence for a second-degree murder plea. He was eligible for parole in 2000, but the parents of Stephen Wells have made it a point to make sure he serves the maximum. Monroe, who complained that he hasn't had a decent night's sleep since he entered prison, has begged the Wells for forgiveness and says he regrets not only participating in the killing of their son, but his guilty plea as well. I was just a stupid kid. If I'd have known that 15 years to life meant I was never going to get out of prison, I would never have pleaded guilty, said Monroe. For the survivors of the freeway killer's madness, Bonin's execution hasn't meant an end to their grief. Now I stay home all the time. I'm paranoid. I don't go out after dusk. The only thing that gets me out of bed is my hobbies, like crochet and painting, said the mother of one of Bonin's victims. People say time makes things easier. Well, I'm still waiting. I wish I could be happy. I just can't find my way out of this maze. For others, the search for their missing children goes on, and the only person who can say for sure whether Bonin was their killer died in the execution chamber at San Quentin. The mother of one victim, whose disappearance bears remarkable similarity to Bonin's M.O., found out only on the day of Bonin's execution that the freeway killer was going to take his secrets to the grave. She begged authorities for one more day just to ask about her son, but the governor couldn't be located to issue a stay. He was out of town. We tried up until two or three minutes before the execution, said Barbara Brogley, whose 14-year-old son disappeared about the time Bonin was plying his gruesome trade. His bones were found years later near Ortega Highway. I would like to know definitely, she said. It would be a complete closure. If Bonin did do it, the man's been punished and he'll be dealt with at a higher level. For quite a while, I've been really praying to find out, to know whether he's dead or alive, and I've been praying for strength to get through it. I really believe my prayer was answered, and God will take care of the rest.